It's been said that if you live long enough, you'll either get Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, or both. And that's because as we live, neurons die. And when enough neurons die, we develop cognitive impairments. We develop some sort of neurological abnormalities. And the two most common ones would be Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease. Today's lecture is on Alzheimer's disease, which is a common dementia that affects uh, certainly the parietal lobes, uh, temporal lobes, uh, and really the entire brain. But compared to other dementias, parietal and temporal, region, and, uh, temporal regions are going to be affected more heavily. <clears throat> Alzheimer's disease is a disease of memory. In this lecture, we're going to talk a bit about what Alzheimer's disease looks like, what causes Alzheimer's disease, and how it's treated. <clears throat> now, when you hear Alzheimer's disease, you should be thinking plaques and tangles. After this lecture, you should stop thinking plaques and tangles and think about soluble versions of those pathological hallmarks. But classically, when we'd slice open a brain, post-mortem of course, and look at the brain of an Alzheimer's patient, what we would see are plaques and tangles, along with substantial neurodegeneration. Now when we're talking about dementia, what we mean is cognitive impairment that causes uh, significant uh, um, uh, dysfunction in daily living or uh, clinically significant distress. That's what makes anything a mental disorder. Clinically significant distress or impairment in your ability to work, play, and love. That would be your daily function. Before we hit full-on dementia, we have uh, a prodromal state called mild cognitive impairment. So we have cognitive impairment, but it's mild. It's not enough to really impair our ability to work, love, and play. Our daily function hasn't yet been completely compromised. We think that uh, mild cognitive impairment, or MCI, is prodromal because you see a higher rate of conversion to dementia. So we think that on your way from cognitively normal to dementia, MCI is kind of a, a stopping point. <clears throat> and for some folks, that's as far as they progress. But for others, they move on to dementia. The annual rate of conversion is about 10%, so about 10% of folks with MCI will have Alzheimer's dementia the next year. <clears throat> this increases if you have certain biomarkers that suggest you have Alzheimer's disease on its way, such as an increase in phospho-tau, or what might seem surprising to you all is a decrease in A-beta-42. The reason for that is because of the plaques. So whenever we're talking about a plaque, this is made of A beta, amyloid beta. We call it that because it came from amyloid, because these plaques, let's say we're looking at a brain slice here, this is a big ball of protein that kind of looks like starch. Rather than calling it starch because it doesn't sound very scientific, we use, I think, the Latin for it, which would be amyloid. So it looks like starch. It's a big ball of protein. That's all it means. And we call it beta because whenever we were isolating the peptides, it wasn't the first one. And it wasn't the third one. It was the second protein that came out. So we call it A beta, amyloid beta. A beta, before it's in a plaque, is just floating around. But in folks with Alzheimer's disease, this A beta aggregates into the plaque and that's why floating around in the CSF let's say here's a big old ventricle here full of CSF if your A beta has aggregated there's less of it floating around in the CSF so that drop in soluble A beta is indicative of Alzheimer's disease and that's because it's aggregated into this big ball of amyloid once we progress on to dementia at this point, the cognitive impairment is clinically significant. It's impaired daily function, and it's only going to get worse over time. So AD is an aggressive and 
progressive dementia. So that means it's going to get worse over time. The disease is going to progress. The initial stages are going to be mild, and they'll progress to moderate and eventually severe. The neuropathological hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease, as we can see here in this figure, first and foremost, severe atrophy. Global atrophy of the cortex, um, focusing a little more on the parietal and temporal regions, but every lobe is going to see degeneration. We'll also see more pronounced degeneration of the hippocampus. So perhaps right around here in the temporal lobes, we'd have our hippocampus, and this is the site of memory storage, at least for some brief period of time. All the memories that you're aware of, any autobiographical memories, semantic memories, so all the junk that you're learning in this class, you're going to hold it in your hippocampus, at least until the exam comes, and then you'll probably lose it. The stuff that you remember for good gets transferred from the hippocampus into the cortex. So memory function is going to be impaired. More distant memories will be spared to some degree, but because of the global atrophy of the cortex, distant memories will also be lost in Alzheimer's disease, as will other neurocognitive uh, functions, such as uh, sensory motor function or, uh, uh, for example, knowing where they are in space. Alzheimer's patients tend to get lost because of that degeneration in the parietal lobes. Language function uh, can degenerate problem solving, uh, can worsen because of atrophy of the frontal lobes. And along with that severe atrophy, you can see in, in the rest of the panels, amyloid. And that amyloid could be outside of cells, we call it amyloid plaques, or it could be inside of cells, we call it neurofibrillary tangles. It's made of two different proteins. Those on the outside would be amyloid plaques, and those inside would be tangles. So there's your plaque. But inside a neuron, We'll see big balls of protein, and that'd be your neurofibrillary tangles. The tangles are made of a protein called tau, which we're going to get to later, and the plaques are made of a beta. Not to spoil the story here, but we think that a beta is going to cause all the problems, and it's going to cause tau to misbehave. So we've got two proteins that are the star of the show today, a beta, and tau. A beta forms extracellular plaques, tau forms intracellular tangles. We'll start off with A beta. And, and we're going to talk about um, heritable forms of Alzheimer's disease. Even though they're the minority of cases, uh, they are instructive into how the disease comes about. <clears throat> so one of the, the hints as to what's causing Alzheimer's disease was the fact that uh, folks with Down syndrome develop early onset Alzheimer's disease without fail, and that's because they have three copies of chromosome 21. On chromosome 21, we have a protein called APP, which is shown in that illustration there. <clears throat> APP, which means amyloid precursor protein, is the protein that's the precursor to amyloid. It's exactly what it sounds like. Amyloid precursor protein lives on the cell membrane. So here's my cell. Give it a little nucleus in here. There's some organelles, but uh, who cares? So here's my cell membrane on the outside. That's what separates in from out. And spanning that is amyloid precursor protein. This creates a beta whenever it's cut by a couple different secretases. So these are kind of similar to those shedases that we talked about in previous lectures. Uh, let's give our membrane a little bit of girth here. So remember we got a lipid bilayer and cutting within the lipid bilayer we have another one of those secretases. So there's beta secretase and there's gamma secretase. There's also an alpha but we won't talk about that. When beta and gamma secretase cut APP that creates soluble A beta. Now, gamma secretase can cut A beta in a couple different spots, as we can see in that illustration on the bottom there. And what I've done is color code the amino acids for you. The blue ones are polar or charged amino acids, in other words, the ones that are water-soluble. The red ones are nonpolar amino acids, 
Now, the reason why there's so much red over there on the right of A beta is because that's the part that's stuck in the membrane. It has to be hydrophobic to, to span the membrane there. Depending on where we cut, we can create A beta of different lengths. The two most common lengths are going to be A beta 40 or A beta 42. Those two extra amino acids are within the membrane. And so this version is far more hydrophobic. That means that it tends not to stay soluble in water. So what's it going to do? Aggregate. This is going to aggregate more readily and form our amyloid. So the amount of A-beta that you make and the type of A-beta that you make is what's going to determine the risk of Alzheimer's disease. And when it comes to heritable forms of Alzheimer's disease, all of these mutations center around increasing the amount of A-beta-42. Some of these are going to just increase the total amount of A-beta. For example, on the top there, that Swedish mutation. So, two different amino acids right next to each other get mutated. And when that happens, it makes it a whole lot easier for beta secretase to cut APP. And if beta secretase is cutting APP more, we make more A beta. Other mutations, either in gamma secretase itself, so those bottom uh, two rows, the presenilin proteins, those are a component of gamma secretase. Uh, other mutations, such as the, um, uh, where are we at there, the, the Florida mutation and the London mutation, those are mutations in APP that, in, that cause gamma secretase to cut a little bit further down in the membrane and create more A beta 42. Now there's one green row here. There's the Icelandic mutation. So there's a um, large family of folks in Iceland who have lower instances of Alzheimer's disease and that's because they have a mutation that interferes with A beta's ability to cleave APP. If A beta is not cleaving APP as much, we're not making as much A beta. If we're not making as much A beta, won't aggregate and make that amyloid and cause Alzheimer's disease. That's the story. One last thing to think about here would be mutations that cause the late onset or sporadic Alzheimer's disease. And these occur in apolipoprotein E4. So there's a few versions of APOE. There's a few different alleles. And they're going to have different abilities to clear A beta. So anytime a cell is active, so if this cell here is active, let's say it's a neuron and it fires an action potential, that's going to stimulate the production of A beta. So every cell makes A beta. All your cells are making A beta right now. That A beta that gets produced can be cleared out into the blood. Sometimes that doesn't happen properly. The amyloid builds up in our blood vessels and we get that cerebral amyloid angiopathy that we've discussed before. Our ability to move A beta out of the brain and into the blood is dependent on carrier proteins, the apolipoproteins. Now, having one or two alleles of ApoE4 increases your risk of developing Alzheimer's disease because ApoE4 can't bind A beta as efficiently. So, if you have a couple of ApoE4s, as you can see on the bottom there in the text, the onset increases. So, you tend to see Alzheimer's appearing earlier in life. It's still after 65, so it's late onset. Thus, we call it sporadic, not familial. And it increases the risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. So, much higher prevalence of Alzheimer's disease in folks with ApoE4. And that's because of what we're seeing in that graph there. In this case, we're looking at the ability of ApoE2, uh, 3, and 4 to bind to a beta. So, ApoE3 and 4 have been uh, noted there. What I want you to keep in mind, there's, there's really 
three lines for ApoE 2, 3, and 4. These are binding curves. ApoE 2 and 3 can bind A beta fairly well. So on the x-axis, what we're looking at is the concentration of ApoE proteins that they had to put on to stick to A beta. If you have a lower binding affinity for A beta, we're going to have to add a whole lot more protein to see sticking. And that's precisely what we see with ApoE4. So, since ApoE4 can't bind A beta as readily and remove it from the brain, folks with ApoE4 are going to have a buildup of A beta. That's going to allow it to aggregate, form plaques, and eventually kill off the brain, if the plaques matter. But we will get a buildup of A beta. So the sporadic mutations that are associated with Alzheimer's disease center around improper clearance of A beta. One interesting idea about why some folks develop Alzheimer's and others don't <clears throat> has to do with what we call the default mode network. It's a network of neurons that are active whenever you're not doing anything, whenever you're just daydreaming, uh, vegging out, watching TV. Let's say just ooh. Then your default mode network is active. Think of it just your, your engine is idling. So when you're not cognitively challenged, there's a certain set of brain regions that we tend to see as being active. And those are shown on the left of that illustration. Now, step on over into the middle, you'll see where amyloid tends to build up, and you'll see that those patterns are pretty similar. And where we tend to see amyloid deposition and default uh, mode network activity, that's also where we tend to see atrophy in Alzheimer's disease. So if you're not cognitively challenged, if you're not reading, learning new things, you're just keeping up with the Kardashians all day, you're just letting the default mode network run. And those neurons in the default mode network are going to be very active. And every time they're active, they spit out A-beta. So you get a whole lot of A-beta building up in your default mode network. Because you keep making A-beta in the same spot, A-beta builds up, you get your plaques, you see atrophy, and you have Alzheimer's dementia. That's one idea. Now, largely, um, there's, there's not always a family history of Alzheimer's disease, so you, you, you'll oftentimes not have a parent or grandparent with it, and, and you'll know that it's coming. The, the early onset forms are the heritable versions, whereas the, the, the late onset ones, they, they, they constitute at least 90% of Alzheimer's cases, those are sporadic, meaning no family history. So it's of interest to us to identify potential risk factors for that. So something like hyperactive default mode network, it's an interesting idea. Now let's get into how the, the pathophysiology of Alzheimer's works. So it, it does come down to A beta, it does come down to tau, but I'm not really sure if it's the plaques themselves uh, that are the problem. And part of this has to do with the fact that plaques come on so early in the, in the disease. You can see plaques long before you see dementia. And that's what this illustration is trying to show us. If, if we look over time, before we actually enter mild cognitive impairment or, or mild uh, AD, we already have substantial plaque pathology. We already have neurofibrillary tangles. We already have the loss of, of synapses. In fact, before we have cognitive impairment, we have to lose uh, a large number of synapses. We have what we call uh, cognitive reserve. We have an excess of synapses. There's not just one, one specific pattern dedicated to one bit of information. There's overlapping patterns. So that if you have one neuron uh, die on you, you don't lose all that information that it dealt with. There's redundancy. So you need to see a large number of synapses and neurons lost before you can notice it. Now, some folks will estimate that it's a couple decades uh, before you have cognitive impairment that, that this pathology comes on. 
And one of the reasons that we think that is because you can detect plaques in cognitively normal individuals, and that's what these data are showing us. So on top, um, we're, we're looking at a non-demented patient that doesn't show binding of PIB. PIB is Pittsburgh Compound B, because it was developed in Pittsburgh. This is a PET ligand, and what it's going to do is stick to amyloid. So here's a big A beta plaque in a brain. PIB is this PET ligand that will stick, so we'll bind PIB to our plaque here, and whenever we go into the PET scanner, our plaques light up. So you get your PIB signal where you have amyloid, and if you don't have amyloid, you don't see a PIB signal. So if you look on that top row, that's just going from top to bottom in different horizontal slices there on MRI, and they're overlaying the PET signal on that. So on top, not a whole lot of color. Everything that's black and white is just showing you structure. The, the red and yellow colors are showing you the PIB binding. In the middle, that's an awful lot of PIB. This person has amyloid in their brain, but they're not demented. You're going to have a bunch of amyloid, no dementia, no cognitive impairment. This suggests to us either plaques have absolutely nothing to do with the disease, which probably isn't true, or that plaques come on before we see dementia. Now, if you look on the bottom, demented patient, a lot of PIB. If we're dealing with Alzheimer's dementia, you should see substantial PIB binding because Alzheimer's disease is associated with plaques. But it might not be the plaques themselves that are causing the problem. The plaques might be indicative of a problem, but maybe not the problem per se. And one idea is that coming off of these plaques, we have soluble A beta. Soluble forms of A beta that haven't quite aggregated enough to fall out of solution and form a big ball of amyloid. Instead, they're just oligomers, meaning it's not just one peptide, it's a handful. We don't know how many. But some multimer, some number of peptides have come together and formed an oligomer that kind of floats around. And we can see those oligomers in, in these images shown there. So the plaques are shown in blue. The top row is showing you in vivo imaging, so the animal is still alive and they're actually uh, imaging its brain through a hole in the skull. And the one on the bottom is, is a post-mortem, so they took the brain out, sliced it, and stained it. Obviously the, the staining looks a lot better, but the animal is no more. So blue on, in the left column, that's showing us plaques. The red is showing us oligomers, and what you'll see is that surrounding the plaques we have halos of little red oligomers. These oligomers are free to float away, and that's important because if they're going to damage neurons, they need to be in solution. They need to be able to float around and hit them. Think about it this way. If I have a big pile of bullets, that's not going to hurt me. But if those bullets are flying around the room, then they have a chance to hurt me. That bullet has to actually encounter my body to damage it. If it's just sitting there not moving around, it can't bump into me and hurt me. So we think maybe the soluble versions are a little more damaging, and, and, and data like this are, are strongly suggestive of it. So blue is showing us the plaque, and on the right they just kind of highlight it around it. And we're looking at three different dendrites at, at different closeness to the plaque. In other words, those that are in the halo and those that are outside. And the dendrites that are outside the halo tend not to be damaged. So there's a high concentration of oligomers near the plaque, and as you move away, lower, lower concentrations. And this is related to the amount of pathology. Those dendrites very much near the plaque are all damaged and dystrophic, and those away are still healthy, they have all their synapses on them, and everything looks good. Uh, it should be said this is a vast oversimplification, of course. But whenever we inject A-beta oligomers into the brain, of living animals, what we can see is a very short-lived impairment in cognitive function. Their ability to learn how to navigate a maze, for example, is impaired for about a day uh, after injecting A-beta oligomers.
Now we think that those A-beta ligamers are probably interacting with specific proteins because if we were to take that A-beta ligamer and first bind an antibody to it to kind of mask it, so now it can't stick to whatever its target is because our antibodies have covered the oligomer up. If we cover up the oligomer with antibodies, no more cognitive impairment. And after the natural clearance of A beta by ApoE, that cognitive impairment goes away. So if you test the same animals, not a day later, but 10 days later, they're able to learn to navigate the maze. So we see short-lived learning impairments. We see an impairment in something called long-term potentiation. Uh, this is what we think of as the cellular basis for learning. So remember your, your heavy in plasticity. Cells that fire together wire together. The way that they wire together is by increasing synapse strength. And that's what happens in LTP, or long-term potentiation. When two neurons are activated together, the synapses between them become stronger. That's how we learn. With a beta oligomers around, the ability to undergo LTP is impaired. And that kind of explains why learning might be impaired, along with just nerve cell death and the loss of synapses. Now, those neurofibrillary tangles, that brings us back to tau. Tau is an intracellular protein that binds to microtubules. And one of the important things that microtubules do is allow intracellular transport. And this is very important for neurons. Remember that neurons can only make proteins in their cell body and to a limited degree in the dendrites, but they do not make proteins in their axon. So, let's get us a, a cell body up here, and we'll put a, a, a little axon there, and there's our um, presynaptic site. I'm going to put some dendrites on to try to make this look a little less inappropriate. Okay, so cell body, this is where we can make our protein. We don't make any protein in our axon, but our axon is where we have our presynaptic site. This is where we spit out our neurotransmitter to arrive at some postsynaptic site on another neuron. If we don't have proteins in our axon, our axon doesn't function properly. So what we have to do is traffic proteins down our microtubules. So think of your microtubules as a little road. And that's the road that our proteins travel along in order to replenish the presynaptic proteins. We can't make them locally. We have to make them up here in the cell body and ship them on down. What we can see in these data shown on, on the uh, right there. On top, what we're doing is exposing uh, squid axons to just regular old tau or a form of tau that we see in Alzheimer's disease. So one that's been hyperphosphorylated, for example. So this, we'll call it AD tau. So what they've done is made a fake form of tau that mimics what we see in Alzheimer's disease. And when they put that on, what you'll notice there is over time, so as you go from left to right on that x-axis, there's a decrease in the rate of anterograde transport. That's what's shown in black. The kind of gray um, data are showing you retrograde transport, so going back to the cell body. So with our AD tau, what we do is decrease anterograde transport. We no longer resupply the presynaptic site with protein. So what we get is essentially starvation at the synapse. We run out of protein. Since proteins do everything for us, without proteins we can't do anything. Now this AD form of tau also forms little cellular, soluble oligomers within the cell. Now it does form these big clumps of protein called neurofibrillary tangles, but there's also soluble versions. 
And one interesting idea is that this soluble form of tau seems to be able to jump from cell to cell and spread kind of like a prion. It misfolds other forms of tau to make it look like AD tau. It impairs intracellular transport within that neuron, and what you get is the spread of neurodegeneration. So we think that tau kills neurons by starving the synapse and impairing synaptic uh, the, I'm sorry, uh, with impairing uh, the transport of synaptic proteins. So by impairing retrograde transport, the synapse starves. If neurons don't have properly functioning synapses, they don't survive. A beta has a couple of ways that it could kill the cell. So, we've, we've already covered excitotoxicity. It's back. We think that a beta can cause excitotoxicity by binding to NMDA receptors. So at the postsynaptic site, we're spitting out a neurotransmitter that's going to bind to a receptor. In the case of glutamate, it's got a couple of receptors that it can bind to. So here's our pre- and postsynaptic sites, postsynaptic density. We have our AMPA receptors. These are just run-of-the-mill. Uh, standard glutamate receptors responsible for fast synaptic transmission. The ones that we care about for the purposes of this discussion is NMDA receptors. Now these are still glutamate receptors. They also bind glycine and when they bind those two neurotransmitters they have very long open times so what you get is a whole bunch of depolarization and what should ring some bells for you is a massive increase in calcium within the cell. Prolonged elevations in intracellular calcium can be toxic because they cause the creation of the mitochondrial transition pores. So, one of the things that a beta does is stick to NMDA receptors. And that's what we can see in the data shown on the left. So NR1, the green signal, is showing you neurons that have NR1 subunits. Those are one of the protein subunits that make up NMDA receptors. So green is NMDA receptor. The red is showing you A beta oligomers. On bottom, in what's called panel C there, the green signal is for GAD, and that's the synthetic enzyme that makes GABA. So this is showing you more um, inhibitory synapses, and there's not a lot of overlay between oligomers and GABA receptors, but there's great overlay between oligomers and NMDA receptors. Along with this, if you apply A beta with glycine to little uh, frog embryos that express NMDA receptors, you can generate a current. You increase the amount of current that those NMDA receptors are generating, even though there's no glutamate present. So this is showing us that A-beta sticks at or near NMDA receptors, and A-beta can cause NMDA receptor currents. So if A-beta is stimulating depolarization and increase in intracellular calcium, that could lead to excitotoxicity. It could do it through NMDA receptors. It could also do it by just making holes in the membrane. Keep in mind, a-beta came from the membrane. It's about half hydrophobic, half hydrophilic. It doesn't mind sticking into a membrane, and that's what these data are showing us here. Panel A is showing us without uh, any A-beta in their pipette, they didn't really see any holes get made. Believe it or not, that's what those data are showing you, because there's no change in the amount of capacitance current that they're getting. In other words, those little blips stay the same size. These little, these little uh, capacitance currents that you get whenever you fluctuate your uh, membrane potential, those are going to get much larger whenever you have holes in the membrane, whenever you're actually able to influence membrane potential. This is noise. This is showing us that we're, that we're getting access to the cell. So what they did was patch on using a little glass pipette, they put that on the surface of the cell and just waited. When they didn't have any A-beta, no hole. But 
whenever their pipette contains a beta, which I'm going to just make as little dots here, those buried into the membrane and made a hole. And that's what allowed them to create more currents there. You can see it a little better on the bottom. In addition to having a beta, what they did was just put some dye into their pipette. So when a beta made holes, that dye filled up the cell. So if you look on the bottom, you look over time, by the time we get to 21 minutes, you can see a little bit of dye in there. We go to 24 minutes, more pronounced, 27, 30 minutes, and you can see the cell body of that cell lit up pretty well, showing you that A beta is making holes in the membrane. If we make holes in our membrane, then obviously the cell is going to depolarize. That membrane potential is going to approach zero. And that cell is not going to be long for this world. So A beta could act through specific receptors, or it could just stick in the membrane and make holes. That'll kill a neuron for sure. Now, one of the issues with tau phosphorylation is that it impairs intracellular transport. It also impairs the ability of tau to do its job, and that is to stabilize microtubules. That's what these data are showing us. So they're looking at the absorbance of light for um, um, just soluble tubulin. Now, if you put tubulin in a tube and wait, it's going to polymerize naturally and form filaments of tubulin. And those filaments are going to absorb more light. So that open set of, uh, uh, I think they, they look like circles to me, that just kind of goes up over time, that's showing us with normal old tau. Not the hyperphosphorylated version of tau that we see in Alzheimer's disease. The hyperphosphorylated version of tau, you can see the, the filled um, circles, maybe squares, hard to tell, just stays a flat line. Tubulin is not assembling, so tau isn't able to bind to and stabilize microtubules. And without microtubules, we can't possibly transport along the axon, so that's what's causing the problem there. Now the linkage between A beta and tau probably lies with that hyperphosphorylation of tau. So that when A beta binds to the NMDA receptors, what this does is stimulate a protein called glycogen synthase kinase. And glycogen synthase kinase, being a kinase, is going to add phosphate groups onto proteins. That's what kinases do, for the most part. Some will phosphorylate other things like DNA or, or uh, lipids. But this one's going to phosphorylate proteins. One of them will be glycogen synthase, but another one, tau. So when we have that increase in A-beta production or a decrease in A-beta clearance, A-beta levels build up. That then causes them to stimulate NMDA receptors. This could be toxic, so this could cause excitotoxicity. But in all likelihood, homeostasis is going to prevent that. Stimulating NMDA receptors increases the activity of glycogen synthase kinase, and what that does is increase the levels of phosphorylated tau, and we can see an increase in phosphorylated tau in these data. So if you grow little neurons in a dish, and you look at the amount of phosphorylated tau with and without oligomers, so with a beta oligomers is on the bottom, control on top, you'll notice a lot brighter on the bottom, telling us there's more uh, phosphorylated tau there. So whether it's uh, familial AD driving the increase in A-beta or sporadic AD driving the increase in A-beta, maybe it's because of that ApoE4 that prevents us from clearing. So if we don't properly clear out that A-beta, eventually we get hyperphosphorylation of tau. When we have phosphorylated tau, that destabilizes our microtubules, and that causes uh, synaptic starving. So we can't transport synaptic proteins from the cell body down the axon. When our synapses don't work, our neurons don't work. <clears throat> so AD is going to be diagnosed uh, clinically, and nowadays we can confirm it with imaging. Before, we had to wait post-mortem to take the brain out, slice it, and look for plaques and tangles. Without plaques and tangles, it's hard to call it Alzheimer's disease. Now, 
The symptoms of AD are going to change over time because AD is a progressive dementia. With uh, familial cases, the onset is much earlier. It can happen in their 40s. It is certainly going to happen before 65. That's the magic number. So here we can dichotomize AD. Familial is before 65, sporadic is after. <clears throat> Either way, we're going to have, once uh, the disease comes on, there's a, a, a decrease in life expectancy at that point. So you only have so many years to live. The prevalence of Alzheimer's disease is fairly high, actually. So about one in eight people who are over 65 are going to have Alzheimer's dementia. The longer you live, the higher the risk. So every decade after that magic number of 65, you have increased risk of dementia, just like you have increased risk of all the other diseases that we've talked about in this class. The mild cases of AD are, of course, going to have milder symptoms than the moderate and then the severe. Memory is going to be affected, uh, certainly in, in sporadic cases, that's one of the first things that's going to come up, memory impairments, some subtle issues with problem solving. Might not have anything with language, judgment, those might be a little difficult to tell. Motor disorders should not come on. That should not be the first thing that you see. Alzheimer's disease is not a motor disorder. It's a memory disorder. So that's what's going to um, uh, allow us to pick out Alzheimer's. Is that it, it primarily starts with memory, and it's going to be typically a later onset. Um, now, as you move from mild to moderate, those same impairments are just going to get worse, and some others can arise. So it might be much easier then to have uh, language deficits. There might be issues with word finding, things like that. Judgment is going to get worse over time. And, and then daily function is going to be compromised at moderate AD. So they're going to need assistance. And at that point, delusions, hallucinations can begin uh, because of the per pronounced neurodegeneration. And in severe cases, uh, things continue to get worse. Uh, in severe AD, they tend to be bedridden. Uh, they may be unable to speak because the language uh, deficits have progressed. And then there can be issues uh, with swallowing, that be the dysphagia, incontinence. So it progresses and gets worse, but it starts really with memory. That's the principal issue with Alzheimer's disease. Memory uh, and, and keeping track of where you are in space because of that damage in the parietal lobes. As far as treatments go, we really have about uh, two of them, and none of them are disease-modifying. So we can't cure dementia. We can't really change it. It's going to progress. What we can do is maybe prolong uh, the time uh, a little bit, but we won't modify the course of the disease. So for mild and moderate cases of dementia, cholinesterase inhibitors are used. And the reason that we use them is because one of the neuron populations that dies off in Alzheimer's disease would be the cholinergic neurons in the basal forebrain. They're cholinergic, meaning they spit out acetylcholine. Now, these cholinergic neurons are going to communicate with a variety of areas, but one of them that's very important for us would be the hippocampus. Cholinergic input to the hippocampus is going to facilitate memory formation. So it's going to allow neurons in the hippocampus to be more excitable and to fire together and wire together and create memories. So when we lose cholinergic neurons in Alzheimer's disease, we lose some of that excitatory drive. When we lose that excitatory drive to the hippocampus, it's less likely for those neurons to fire together, plus many of them are degenerating. And if they don't fire together, they don't wire together, they don't store any information. So the idea is we give folks a cholinesterase inhibitor because Cholinesterase is going to break down acetylcholine into the acetate and the choline. So by inhibiting that enzyme, we prevent the breakdown of acetylcholine and we allow a little bit more of it to hang out in the synapse. And this is to try to compensate for the loss of cholinergic neurons. So by boosting acetylcholine levels, you can get some short-lived improvement but as soon as that drug is stopped, or if we continue to take the drug, we eventually arrive at the same endpoint. That's what these data are showing us here. So placebo, 
would be filled, and then the two opened uh, uh, shapes are going to be with cholinesterase inhibitor. You'll notice at their final time point, when they allow the drug to wash out, there's been no change in, in cognitive function. There's a little bit of an improvement while they're taking the drug, but it doesn't actually modify the course of the disease. In later stages, in moderate to severe, this is um, when we will use mimentine or, or Nimenda, same thing. <clears throat> they are NMDA receptor inhibitors. We should recall NMDA receptors. Those are a potential target of our A-beta oligomers. And so what we think is happening is that we're hyperactivating NMDA receptors. Now, NMDA receptors are also very important for memory. So this might make the use of memantine, which inhibits NMDA receptors, a little surprising. We're going to inhibit the very protein that we think drives memory formation. And that's because this protein is being um, um, improperly hyperactivated by A-beta oligomers. So we inhibit that and we try to prevent some of that excitotoxicity. This also doesn't modify the course of the disease, but it can produce some short-lived improvements in cognitive function. Patients still continue to decline because we're not addressing the underlying problem. Neurons will continue to degenerate and symptoms will continue to progress. Now, while these drugs provide a little bit of help in demented patients, they actually seem to provide harm in patients with mild cognitive impairment. So the black line in this plot is showing us just no drug treatment, and on the Y we're looking at progression from MCI to AD. That is about a 10% rate every, uh, every year. So if you follow the black line, as it goes from 1, meaning no one has AD, they all have MCI, it's going to move down toward the bottom. As it reaches zero, everyone has AD. That doesn't happen in any of these groups, but we approach zero. Now you'll notice the red and the blue lines, those that are getting the treatments for Alzheimer's disease, are actually reaching that endpoint sooner. The rate of conversion to Alzheimer's disease is much higher. And this might have to do with homeostasis. So if we add cholinesterase inhibitors and bump up acetylcholine levels, what the cell will do is down-regulate cholinergic receptors. So whenever we increase acetylcholine levels, that's going to stimulate acetylcholine receptors. When we do that, the cell is going to have a homeostatic response, and that is down-regulate them. So the effectiveness of acetylcholine is going to drop because of the use of the drug. So it, 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 that might explain what's going on here. Same thing with mimetine. If we inhibit a receptor, the cell is just going to upregulate that, and we're creating more binding sites for A-beta oligomers and, and more chances uh, for them to attack the neurons and cause synaptic death. So these treatments are okay in that they can provide some short-lived improvement, but they don't modify the course of the disease, and when given inappropriately, they can cause harm. So that's AD in a nutshell. We're going to go through these questions in class. In the meantime, email me if you have any questions. See you later.